Um, so let's start this presentation. Uh, as you know, you're that published uh, this uh, briefing called uh, Tale of Two Emergencies, the interplay of sovereign debt and climate crisis in the global south. Uh, we published it uh, right before Christmas, but we wanted to do a presentation uh, to be able not just to share uh, that work, but also to start up a discussion among uh, dead and climate activists on, on how to tackle those uh, crises. I have a presentation prepared. It uh, will be around 15 minutes, so you will have to hear me up for, uh, uh, for some time now. Uh, but then afterwards, the idea is to questions and answers for if you have any doubts on the presentation uh, and but then afterwards for a discussion for a strategic discussion on, on how to work how to fight together uh, these two crises uh, in a coordinated way uh, I, I also asked uh, colleagues uh, Harjit from ActionAid and Leia from Eurodat uh, to do a, an input uh, for that discussion. So we will be hearing also uh, an input from them afterwards. Um, so let me start with the presentation and I will share the screen and see if it works. Here. <coughs> Okay, so you should see both the presentation and, and my floating head, uh, head. This is something new we learned uh, not long ago. Um, the first thing is that you will find uh, the report at the Eurodat uh, website, both in uh, Spanish, in English, uh, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, so we're very happy that the, the, the work is available in different languages. Uh, and we will try to make to make this uh, presentation also available in different uh, languages. Uh, first thing is, um, we decided to do this because uh, climate came com keep kept coming up in uh, in debt policy uh, debates and debt policy uh, strategies. But also, we were seeing how debt was uh, every day more. Uh, present in climate uh, debates and climate discussions. Uh, we had some works from other organizations, civil society organizations, for instance, uh, Erlas Jar, which is a German Jubilee campaign, <coughs> also Jubilee Debt campaign in the UK, publishing um, articles, organizing campaigns, publishing papers on how uh, debt was uh, crippling the possibilities, of, the chances of uh, global South countries to fight the climate uh, emergency, but also how the climate emergency was fueling the debt crisis in, in different countries, even before uh, the, the debt crisis was enhanced because of uh, the COVID-19 economic crisis. Uh, this uh, interlinkages between debt and, and climate were not only obvious for uh, civil society and also for the peoples in the global south who were suffering from debt crisis at the same time as they were suffering from uh, the climate emergency, but also uh, international financial institutions, bank or the IMF were increasingly or are increasingly recognizing <coughs> sorry, these interlinkages. Uh, for instance, the World Bank in a, in a paper uh, talking about was recognizing that the, the higher frequency of uh, climate extreme events uh, was actually impacting the macroeconomic stability of countries and posing growing risks to debt sustainability. And the IMF also did a quantitative uh, analysis on how natural disasters not only directly linked to climate, but uh, large natural disasters were causing significant damage uh, uh, to, the, to the countries <coughs> uh, were contributing to a rise in public debt. Uh, this is what um, our friend in Jubilee Caribbean uh, 
sorry, Heron Belfon. I don't know if she's uh, in, in, in the room. I don't see her. Well, uh, Heron called it uh, the, the dead and climate vicious circle. A, a vicious circle where countries in a situation of unsustainable debt had no fiscal space to invest in climate re resilience and invest in adaptation and in, in, in mitigation infrastructures. And when uh, they were suffering increasing, as they were suffering increasing uh, impacts of climate extreme events, they had to uh, access new borrowing, borrowing to cover uh, the loss and damages of those uh, ex climate extreme events, which led to even uh, more unsustainable debt. <coughs> This vicious circle uh, is uh, enhanced by one, the inexistence of a loss and damage uh, agreed uh, finance. Uh, so when a country uh, suffers the impacts of, an, of a climate extreme event, uh, they, they don't have a reliable finance source to cover for uh the the this these losses and these damages and and to, to fund reconstruction and, and recovery but there's also other uh, issues to take into account one is higher borrowing costs so there are several uh studies and and, and research uh, that focus on first how mm, countries in the global south are paying higher borrowing costs than uh, other countries with uh, similar uh, macroeconomic macroeconomic indicators, but also how the most climate vulnerable countries are paying even higher borrowing costs than the neighbors without uh, such vul climate vulnerabilities. This makes uh, debt payments even more unsustainable. Uh, and then there is also the issue of when a climate extreme event happens in the global south, and this is especially uh, in particularly important, for instance, for uh, small island <coughs> uh, developing states uh, in the Caribbean or in the Pacific, uh, debt payments still have to continue. So you find countries like uh, Grenada, uh, Antigua, Barbados, uh, facing uh, devastating climate events uh, and same day or the day after the, a hurricane hits the country, they have to make a payoff of uh, debt service to their private creditors, to the IMF, to the World Bank, to the different creditors. Uh, so one of the calls from the civil society have been for a long time uh, to set up a system of uh, debt suspension and debt relief after uh, a climate event. We can uh, get to get back to, to, to that proposal later on. Uh, so in sum, debt vulnerabilities uh, weaken the country's capacity to deal with climate emergencies. This is especially relevant in the situation we're living today as uh, COVID-19 uh, economic, social and health crisis is actually uh, enhancing uh, the, the, the debt, these debt vulnerabilities and many countries are going through a uh, important debt crisis today. Uh, lending to deal with these climate disasters, which is the resource that these countries have, uh, actually fuels uh, the fire when uh, this fire is at its peak. Uh, climate vulnerabilities, as I said, make this uh, borrowing even costlier, which enhances uh, their vulnerabilities. And then there's to account, for instance, the pressure over natural resources of uh, the debt crisis. So when a country is in a debt crisis, they tend to put more pressure, more uh, extraction of natural resources, including fossil fuels, uh, both increasing their climate vulnerabilities, for instance, by uh, enhancing uh, desertification, but also uh, um, oh, Ilaria said three minutes left, sorry. And also um, worsening climate change by uh, exploding more uh, fossil fuels. Um, there is an issue 
that uh, maybe we can discuss uh, further in, in the discussion, which is the concept of climate debt. Uh, civil society, academics uh, have uh, reclaimed that there is an ecological debt that rich countries and elites owe to impoverished peoples due to these environmental impacts and resource pillage, uh, both during colonial and neo-colonial uh, dynamics. Uh, and within this ecological debt, there is a climate debt that is a historical, but also a present debt that most polluting economies have uh, with uh, the countries in the global south because of the dis disproportionate cont contribution uh, to the climate change. From this perspective, climate finance shouldn't be considered as charity, as support, as aid, but a moral obligation, a restitution or a repayment of this uh, climate debt. This is also this is something that we can discuss if it's useful uh, for our strategies. Uh, the paper, and I'm not going to stop at this, but the, the paper has a whole chapter on how the climate emergency and the debt crisis have cumulative impacts on women's rights and gender justice. If people is interested in this specific issue, uh, I'm gonna pass in, well, sorry, yeah, pass in the chat um, a, a link to a specific article that uh, I had the, the chance to write for the Gender and Development Journal, uh, specific on this uh, dead and climate um, emergencies impact on women's rights and gender justice. I'm gonna go on. Uh, one of the issues that also the, 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 the paper looks at is at how uh, the current approaches to climate finance uh, actually are false solutions or not enough solutions, not, uh, not well enough solutions uh, to tackle this both crisis. First, uh, climate finance is mostly uh, offered in the form of loans and especially non-concessional loans, which means that climate finance is actually fooling uh, the debt crisis uh, and then crippling the possibility of developing countries, uh, global south countries, to uh, face the, the, the climate emergency challenges. Uh, if you take, for instance, from uh, 2013 to 20. Uh, 18 up to uh, almost 70, 67 point, <coughs> sorry, 68.8% uh, of the climate finance was made in the form of loans. And this is taking uh, the OECD data uh, as, um, but uh, as uh, other organizations like Oxfam, for instance, put uh, shared, uh, this, this is, uh, even overstated. Uh, so um, this, uh, when when you take the the net value of these loans, the climate finance uh, that is made in the form of grants is even lower. Uh, there is a recent uh, paper by Allianz Act that actually points out on how this is. Uh, reproduced in the case of uh, European countries. So European countries are prioritizing loans uh, and uh, before uh, grants in their climate finance. So I'll also recommend you to check out this uh, very recent paper. Finally, there are several, which, sorry, I'm in the middle of the presentation, uh, several uh, market mechanisms like risk, risk insurance, hurricane clauses, catastrophe bonds or green bonds uh, that are the ones that the IFIs normally point out as solutions uh, to both climate and, and, and debt problems. But the, they tend to be uh, false solutions. So one of the questions we need to answer is, can these market-based approaches to climate finance provide just solutions. Uh, and one of the issues to take into account here is what ActionAid said uh, in, uh, for instance, a, a report on climate, <coughs> sorry, on market-based mechanisms for loss and damage, uh, which is that they ignore absolutely the human rights uh, perspective. Uh, finally, and I, and I, quickly saw there was a question on, on debt for climate swaps, and we could uh, discuss that uh, later, is whether debt for climate swaps are uh, a solution. As you might know, debt for climate swaps is this 
uh, instrument where uh, a country or a non-governmental organization um, sort of, uh, if it's a non-governmental organization buys a part of a uh, debt from a country in the global south, if it's a country, they just cancel part of that debt uh, and then the rest of that debt needs to be invested in climate related investments. Uh, this is not new. There's been uh, debt for development, debt for health, debt for investment swaps for a long time. And experiences uh, so far haven't been very successful at significantly reducing debt burdens. They normally cover uh, too little debt relief to provide a solution to the debt problem. They tend to be complex and lengthy to negotiate. Uh, so they are not good for, for instance, loss and, as loss and damage solutions. Uh, and also uh, the, there's a risk of them of not providing additionality uh, and also risk of uh, ODA, of uh, official development aid, double con counting. And finally, and I think the, the, the biggest concern around uh, debt for climate swaps or any other debt swaps is the risk of it being tied aid. This is uh, not ensuring country ownership uh, or, or these uh, debt swaps becoming uh, conditionality in, in this guise. This is something that we can, we can discuss and, and uh, as Eurodad we have a plan to organize a, a more lengthy and calm discussions around uh, debt for debt swaps in general and debt for climate swaps in particular. <coughs> Uh, and if there is a way that this could actually provide a good, uh, a good solution. And finally, uh, and I'm finishing with this, the report uh, um, presents several recommendations on how to deal with interconnected impacts of sovereign debt and climate crisis. The first one and most general one is a just feminist and green recovery to the crisis. Uh, that we're suffering today um, that lays the foundations of resolving debt and climate crisis. So a, a, a feminist economy, a green economy that actually allows uh, countries in the global south for sustainable development is the best solution for, this, uh, for these two crises. But then more specifically, uh, we need to push for fair, sufficient, but also for non-debt creating climate finance. This is important, especially with COP26 coming up uh, later this year to focus that the climate finance agreements that are made also include this idea of grants before loans or at least of non-concessional uh, lending available for developing countries. Second, uh, debt payment suspension and debt relief in the aftermath of climate disaster. So when a hurricane hits uh, a country in the global south, the debt payments are uh, instantly suspended. Uh, there is a moratorium and then uh, the countries can uh, start a process with debt cancellation and debt restructuring according uh, to the damages of uh, that event and the situation of the country. Obviously, providing finance to address loss and damage that doesn't create further debt, uh, but then timely and sufficient debt relief, debt cancellation for countries in the global south, regardless of uh, the, 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 the climate uh, impacts or the climate events, um, which is something that, uh, civil society is asking for in general. Also a review of the debt sustainability uh, concept, including climate vulnerabilities in that debt sustainability concept uh, to advance towards uh, multilateral debt resolution mechanisms that are fair, that is um, under the UN auspices, <coughs> that is transparent, that is reliable, that, it's, that, it, that offers uh, debt cancellation in a timely matter. Uh, and finally, in the situation that we're living today, provide emergency additional finance that doesn't create new debt. Uh, and in this uh, way, uh, CSOs are campaigning or pushing for a uh, special drawing rights emission in the, at the IMF. 
uh, sorry if it's been very fast, but the, I'll leave it at there and maybe we can take some rounds of questions uh, and then we can go into the into the discussion. I see a lot of messages. So uh, Ilaria, if you can help me out there. I'll yes, hi, Yolanda. Thank you for the presentation. We have quite a lot of questions. And the first one you already addressed, the one on climate, uh, let me see from Ivan, on climate uh, swaps. So we can go with the question from Claudio. And he asks, um, there are different kinds of debt instruments. Uh, could there be a creation of new financial instruments catered towards solving finance, financing reconstruction after disasters and emergencies that would have different beneficial longer terms to the borrower, including risk assessments on frequency of climate originated emergencies? Uh, thank you. That's, uh, maybe, Claudio, uh, maybe you can take the stand and, and, and share this because it seems a proposal more than a... <laughs> Than a question. Would you like to intervene? Sure. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, it seems like a proposal in a sense that uh, we see quite a lot of uh, instruments to reduce risks, to calculate, uh, you know, uh, how to say, English is, is kind of running away from my mind right now, but. Uh, it's a technical term, but anyway, it's so there are several instruments that can be created to come to a position like the last point you made, which would be a, a condition that the countries that are already vulnerable wouldn't have to borrow again and be under the uh, borrowing and indebtedness stress to try and solve their stress they're already into. So it's almost like uh, using uh, loans as a, as a way to try and solve problems that are extremely uh, you know, uh, large for the capacity of the countries. That's what I'm trying to say. For the capacity of the countries, it, it's like uh, adding insult to injury in, in, in a sense. You know what I mean? It's like you're already battered and then you say, okay, yeah, now you are in my hands and then I can say you can borrow at a higher cost. And then you keep that cycle of dependency and this neo-colonialism based on financial instruments. Okay, that's the assessment. So what could we think within this paradigm where some financial instruments would also become interesting for creditors that are hungry for anything and they, are, they have tons of liquidity, that could make that turn, you know, you know what I mean? And then they want to bring the finance to the proper channels without overburdening the borrower or, or the one that is receiving. A little bit. Yeah, I, I think there are two instruments that could be interesting to explore. I'm not sure uh, uh, I would uh, push for them. Well, the first one is what they call the, the, the hurricane clauses. So when a country uh, lends uh, to another country or a multilateral institution or a private creditor, but I would say this could work especially for uh, public lending, uh, they include a hurricane, a hurricane clause. So if there is a climate extreme event, uh, that debt is automatically suspended suspended or cancelled, the, the conditions uh, could be discussed. Uh, one of the issues here is that th th this is instru these instruments uh, exist. Uh, there are also the catastrophe uh, bonds, which are slightly different. But the problem is that when they exist, the parametrics, uh, the, the, the criteria uh, for them to actually uh, pay off uh, for the countries, so for actually uh, suspending the, the debt payments are sometimes not clear, are sometimes too high. So uh, some of the, these criteria, what measures is not the impact of the hurricane in the country, uh, but the uh, speed of the, of the wind of the hurricane. And if, if, if it's uh, a little bit below that uh, speed, if the, it, even when the impact has been uh, massive, 
uh, the clause doesn't uh, doesn't work, doesn't pay off. Uh, so we have to be very careful in uh, because one of some of these instruments can be actually interesting, but uh, the detail is uh, the, the devil is in the detail. Um, another instrument is uh, insurances, risk insurance. The problem is that risk insurance today is a business. It's a private business, so there are no public uh, insurances. There are kind of publicly backed insurances. And the experience, as, as we show in the, in the report, is that it's more beneficiary for the insurance companies than for uh, the, the, the countries that uh, contracted those insurances. So we also have to be very uh, specific on which are the criteria under these insurances and whether we could establish public insurances where the cost, the burden, is not in the global south country because mm, with these insurances is the country in the global south that have not created the climate change the ones paying for that uh, insurance i leave it there sorry and i think there is still time for one question before moving on to the debate and this is coming from klaus who asks, uh, how far is the Caribbean with a group-based crisis response instrument for moratorium and debt relief? Uh, how far? For the moment, very far. Uh, so, um, for the moment, there is not a, 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 an instrument for a moratorium and, and debt relief. Uh, put in place, even when even some countries, some governments ask for it. The thing is, and maybe we can leave it for the discussion later, if we are willing to push uh, for, for that uh, today. The situation of uh, small island development states today, of seeds, is very precarious because of the impact of the COVID-19 into tourism. Uh, so maybe this could be the moment to push for such a for such an instrument but for the moment uh, it's it's far i see uh, yvonne janet uh, with with her hand up uh, maybe we can take her comment and then we go to harjit and, and leia un saludo yolanda a los años así sea vía virtual. Eh, bueno, muchas gracias por el, el informe y la presentación. Estuvo muy interesante porque efectivamente son dos temas que eh, son muy relevantes para los pueblos del sur. ¿no? Yo quería tal vez hacer dos pequeñitos comentarios. Eh, el uno es que eh, tal vez en, en el informe, bueno, Hiciste un, un, un resumen, digamos, ¿no? Habría que, que ver si el, si el informe incluye eh, como parte de estas uh, uh, things that we have to deal with, ¿no? Que es justamente una, digamos, una, una, justo con las mujeres, justo con los pueblos, que se suspende el pago de las deudas, todas estas propuestas que son efectivamente demandas que han existido desde hace muchos años en los movimientos, si es que se considera también eh, la restitución de la deuda ecológica, justamente esta restitución en cash para los pueblos y también, eh, porque obviamente eh, van a decir, sí, vamos a restituir la deuda y les vamos a dar tecnología sujeta a derechos de propiedad intelectual, por ejemplo. Entonces, si es que existe, eh, digamos, esta propuesta también de la restitución a los pueblos por la deuda que existe, o sea, económica, ¿no? Eh, eso, y también, si es que tal vez en el documento se aborda también un poco esta nueva tendencia a eh, la transición energética hacia las renovables, que viene asociada también con endeudamiento como una manera, entre comillas, de enfrentar el cambio climático, pero que causa unos daños tenaces en los países del sur, como sabemos, la explotación de los minerales raros que se utilizan en las baterías, en los generadores eléctricos, en los autos, la balsa que sale del Ecuador para las aspas de los parques eólicos. Es decir, si es que también se incluye, eh, digamos, el endeudamiento que está eh, ya eh, ofrecido 
para esta eh, renovabilidad, digamos, de la energía eh, hacia una transición para enfrentar el cambio climático, pero que de todas maneras lo que hace es volver a eh, endeudarnos, eh, digamos, alrededor del tema de la transición energética. ¿no? Simplemente esas dos cositas quería mencionar. Y muchas gracias por el informe, que además, qué bueno que esté en español también. Sí. Gracias, Ivón. Eh, me sale contestar en español. I'll, I'll, I'll do it in English. But, uh, first, on, on the issue of, uh, of restitution of uh, ecological debt, it's mentioned in the, in the report uh, very briefly. The, the report goes over very different things very briefly. So it doesn't go in deep in, in any of the things. So it's kind of a, a, an attempt to do an overview of different issues. So there is a a small part on, on climate debt and, and ecological debt. Uh, but maybe this is one of the um, recommendations or requests that we should uh, include at the end. So it's not included at the end. And, uh, and I would uh, suggest that we have this discussion, whether we should focus also uh, in, in, in that issue. Uh, the second, uh, yeah, This is what I meant with climate finance and climate for mitigation uh, building up on debt, uh, which is how uh, the, 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 the energy transition, but not only the energy transition, so the, the building uh, of the, the, the climate resilience is being financed mainly through, uh, through lending, through private and through public lending. Uh, and uh, this is especially Uh, particularly important for uh, multilateral development institutions. So for instance, the World Bank uh, is financing most of its uh, climate finance through uh, lending and not through grants. Um, I I'm answering in English because uh, this is going on, on, on YouTube as well and it should go all it, most in English and so we don't have to put uh, now English and now Spanish subtitles to everything. Um, I, I see Marta uh, hand up, but I'm gonna first, Marta, si puede esperar un, un momento. I'm gonna, because I asked uh, Harjit and uh, Leia to, uh, to, to do a small uh, input uh, on, on three questions, uh, and then we can start the debate. So, you, so it's not me that uh, speaks all the time. Uh, and these three questions, sorry, um, I lost them, is uh, if you think that there is an increased interest in, in working on debt in the climate uh, community and on climate among the debt community, if this is something new, if you think there is a space for joint strategies and action on debt and climate movement uh, in the coming months or the coming year, and what uh, opportunities uh, do we have ahead? So. Uh, Harjit, I don't know if I can put you on the spot first. Please go on. I'm, I'm fine if, uh, Leah, you want to go first. Uh, hi, yeah, I can yeah, go uh, also go first. Thanks, Harjit. Um, so, hello everyone, I'm Leah and I work at Eurodad on international climate finance for countries in the global south. Um, thanks for the great presentation, Yolanda, and it's great to see so many of you on the call. Um, I'm going to provide a quick overview of where um, debt issues have emerged within climate-related discussions and fora. Um, as Yolanda's highlighted, the duality of um, the COVID-19 crisis coupled with ongoing climate impacts has brought debt further into the climate policy space and undeniably a greater focus on climate and debt is emerging. The greater focus on the interlinkages between these two crises presents a number of challenges and opportunities to address the duality of these crises. Yolanda has uh, highlighted some of them and I'm looking forward to discussing this with you all later on. Um, but what we're seeing is that a lot of governments and institutions are now rethinking their approaches to climate finance and debt. For instance, the, the IMF, um, the UNFCCC and the EU, particularly in relation to methodologies to carry out assessments of needs 
um, and financial risk. Um, in 2020, there have been a few moments when debt and climate finance have converged, including during the UNFCCC Standing Committee on Finance's discussions on methodologies for determining needs. The UNFCCC is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, debt has also come up during the UNFCCC's climate dialogues last year and again during this year's Climate Adaptation Summit. Um, and what's more, during the UK, um, sorry, within the UK um, COP26 presidency's public climate finance priorities document, debt dynamics have been mentioned 10 times. So clearly there have been a few moments and these are increasing in number. Um, uh, as you see, as you'll have seen from some of the, the moments that I've listed, um, these interlinkages are coming up more in relation to climate finance for countries in the global south than in relation to climate policy as a whole. Although the duality of climate policy and debt, um, they're not completely alien. Um, so for instance, uh, within the context of the um, UN Conference on Trade and Development, we're seeing that there's now a big um, uh, focus on climate issues um, in relation, including in relation to debt. So climate more broadly, not just there being a focus on, on climate finance. Um, as the report and Yolanda's presentation clearly shows, these two crises of, of um, debt and, and climate crisis mutually reinforce each other and the end result is always negative. Um, in order to ensure that the debt and climate finance dynamics don't continue to conflate each other, there are some opportunities coming up in 2021 to ensure that climate finance demands around scalability, um, access to finance, quality of finance, as well as demands on debt sustainability can be jointly addressed. These include um, COP. 26, the UNFCCC Climate Conference. Um, there's a clear opportunity there for policy, advocacy, um, and joint debt and climate campaigning work. It's already on the COP26 presidency's radar and provides an opportunity for all relevant stakeholders, not only the richest nations, to discuss the duality of these crises. Um, there's also this year's review of the IMF's debt sustainability mechanisms um, to integrate climate aspects, so not only climate finance aspects, but climate as a whole. Um, I see this as an opportunity to ensure that climate vulnerabilities, climate risk and climate impacts are integrated into a widely used debt assessment tool. Um, there's also uh, UNCTAD 15, so the UN Conference on Trade and Development, um, which will take place this October, and climate forms a big part of that agenda. Um, UNCTAD is an institution that's currently chaired by Zambia, so it's an opportunity to ensure that the interlinkages between debt and climate are raised at a high level. Um, there's also the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, um, and this is an opportunity to ensure that this fora doesn't continue to just be a knowledge sharing or discussion venue, but instead becomes a space to connect the annual meetings between the World Bank, IMF and G20 Finance Ministers to discussions on effective climate efforts. And then um, lastly, there's also the Italian trio presidency. Um, so um, Italy will be the hold the presidency of the um, pre COP26, so the pre climate conference, as well as the Youth for Climate Summit, the G20, and has also put itself forward to hold the presidency of the Financing Common Summit. So um, there's an opportunity to ensure that there's a link between various different um, summits that recognizes the mutual enforceability um, of these crises and seeks to determine how to address that. Um, so these are all moments in 2021. 
and don't take into account long-term moments. For example, um, the, the 2023 global stock take of climate efforts. However, that's because these crises urgently need to be addressed now. Um, I'll stop there and hand over, hand back to Yolanda and Harjit, but I'd be happy to answer any questions and engage with you more during the discussion part. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a million, uh, Leia, uh, for that uh, overview of uh, opportunities as well. Uh, Harjit, on to you, your floor is yours. Thank you, so Leah has covered uh, it quite comprehensively. So let me just add, add a few points and take a lesser time. So as, as many of you know, uh, for the climate community, Mozambique case in 2019, when it was hit by twin cyclone uh, early in that year was a trigger. And that's where we brought the issues of debt and climate together. And when Mozambique was forced to take loan from, it was appa appalling for us to see that happening, a country that is least responsible uh, for the crisis uh, had to take load again from, from the same system. And now with COVID as economy sh shrank, it is, it is really critical for us, and I'm gonna focus a lot more on civil society um, as Leah has covered uh, the official events. I think it's for us to really build a comprehensive narrative. So Yolanda, the paper that you presented, you know, uh, is, is a great step in that direction. How do we bring the economic justice and climate justice fights together? In terms of, you know, as we see inequality is getting worse and, and debt has a huge role to play. And as you also rightly pointed out, how debt is being uh, you know, given to uh, developing countries for mitigation. And, and there is quite a bit of pressure uh, from Paris Agreement. And when they are being asked to step up and revise their nationally determined contributions, the reality is that those countries are being forced um, with so many market deals and you will see private companies making money and they will be under debt again. And, and while uh, the money for adaptation is not going enough and they continue to face disaster. So we have to really look at the whole thing very, very comprehensively uh, and what kind of instruments and great to hear that discussion on uh, uh, the market instruments being offered and insurance and all that. So how do we now weave the entire thing? And just to give you an example, small island states issued a statement uh, last year after COVID and putting a spotlight on the crisis that they are facing. You know, as small island states and the group AOCIS, which is more active in the climate space, talked about how their debt has reached $50 trillion in 2019, uh, which is 70% increase from 2009, when it was around $30 trillion. And that's, that's the reality they are facing, which means that governments together are also recognizing the uh, interplay between COVID and, and debt and climate and the overall economic crisis that they face. And this is not going to go away in months. And this is where we as civil society, we need to think of a much more medium to long-term perspective. Uh, of course, looking at some of the events that uh, Leah outlined and how do we really uh, create a momentum around that. And, and I'm glad to see that the climate community, you know, we held several consultations in 2019. We worked with many of you as Action Aid to, to really advance that, that discussion. And we got some coverage uh, in terms of uh, traction in media to highlight this whole issue of interface between debt and climate. So I think there is a constituency now and with COVID, the discussion is much more and we have to build on that momentum. I would say Caribbean states and small island states are definitely on our side. And we are seeing those voices coming from government, which is, which is great because as civil society, we have to work closely with them. And, and make that as an initiative that is led by the government and we providing support. So, but the fights we are fighting separately, this is the time when we have to fight this fight together. And that's where this consultation is really, really important. We have to get down to strategy. Look at the events that Leah talked about and how we then bring those messages together, do mobilization, uh, work with finance ministers, and target the whole climate finance system. So I think there's a lot that we can do. And, uh, but of course there's a caution that because debt relief can be a low hanging fruit for policymakers from the global North, let that ha let we should not allow that to happen. And then we don't see any major progress on the overall climate finance system. So we have to be very careful on that front. I'm just kind of raising a caution, but yes, uh, there is a potential and, and this is a dire need as well. 
uh, to really connect the fights around economic justice and climate justice. And we're very happy uh, to work with this group on that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Harjit. Uh, I'm gonna hand it out to Marta Flores now. Uh, and from there we can uh, do some rounds of interventions and, and, and I can keep uh, answering. Thanks, Marta. Gracias, Yolanda. Eh, buenos días. Primero, agradecer a todas y todos, digamos, esta y a ustedes, sobre todo con Eurodad, eh, pues la posibilidad de juntar este momento para compartir y para poder, creo que, profundizar algunos de los elementos que consideramos trascendentales, ¿no? En relación al a abordaje de esta temática. He tenido la posibilidad apenas de ojear muy rápidamente el informe. Celebramos la iniciativa porque colocar todo, digamos que todos estos elementos en un informe que esté disponible en varios idiomas, creo que habla también de como de esa, eh, de esa apertura para poder empezar a debatir en diferentes escenarios. Así que primero como agradecer esa posibilidad. Eh, yo soy parte de Jubileo Suramérica, una red que trabajamos hace 21 años en las cuatro subregiones de América Latina y el Caribe, eh, con una clara línea sobre el tema del, del no reconocimiento del pago de la deuda, ¿no? Por eso hablamos sobre la anulación de deuda. Quisiera colocar eh, cuatro elementos que nos parecen, eh, que hacen también parte un poco del acumulado y, y de ese caminar, no solo de, de la perspectiva de Jubileo Suramérica, sino de otras y otros en los que hemos venido también tejiendo este proceso de entendimiento y este proceso también de eh, cómo, cómo enfrentar, ¿verdad? Efectivamente no hay ninguna fórmula al respecto. Eh, hace pocos minutos nuestra compañera de comunicación, Gleris, colocó en el chat por ahí el link de una investigación que el año pasado hemos realizado como, como colectivo sobre el origen de la deuda y eh, alternativas y, y modelos de resistencia en América Latina y Caribe. Así que invitamos a que puedan, está disponible en portugués y en, y en español por ahora. Creo que eh, el primer elemento tiene que ver, en lo, en lo que quisiera compartir so, y traer al debate, es poder eh, recordar que nosotros estamos hablando de, de un modelo de deuda que tiene su origen, obviamente, en la ilegitimidad como tal. Y desde ese punto de partida, cuando entendemos que de la deuda que estamos hablando es absolutamente inmoral y ilegítima, entendemos que las manifestaciones que nosotras y nosotros como Sur Global tenemos están fundamentadas justamente en ese esquema del norte de, eh, que tiene absolutamente un sustento en la apropiación de todos los espacios, en la apropiación también de nuestra historia en la apropiación de los recursos como tal. Entonces ese es un elemento fundamental sobre el cual creemos que tiene una trascendencia y está conectada con los hilos para colocar el tema deuda, clima y un eje transversal y es la financiarización. ¿Quién financia? ¿Quién es, el, quién es ese actor? ¿Quién es esa, esa, ese elefante en la sala que nosotros decimos? Es decir, esas finanzas tiene que ver entonces con tiene que ver con el poder. Y ese poder obviamente puede manifestarse a través de la instauración o a través de la profundización de ese modelo extractivo que no se limite únicamente a la, eh, y que obviamente tiene mucha repercusión en todo lo que hablamos sobre la explotación de los bienes colectivos vivos, de los espacios vivos. ¿no? Ese modelo de extracción tiene que ver también con el control y apropiación de todas las formas de vida. Es decir, el, el modelo de financiarización del Banco Mundial, del BID, por ejemplo, ese mismo capital corporativo que financia lo mismo una hidroeléctrica es el mismo capital que está financiando la militarización, la violencia, el asesinato y la persecución contra las defensoras y defensores de la vida. Entonces, esa conexión creo que es muy, para nosotros muy importante encontrar porque las finanzas tienen ese modelo de financiarización, obviamente está conectado con la necesidad de asegurar ese control. Y esto es lo tercero, y es que efectivamente todo esto busca seguir perpetuando la deuda. La deuda está creada, obviamente, no estoy diciendo nada nuevo, para nunca terminar de ser pagada. Y entonces nos, se inventan un montón de, de esquemas de, de refinanciar, de repagar, y un montón de, de, y un montón de otros esquemas 
para eso todas estas instancias del multilateralismo vienen asegurando la participación del poder corporativo que hoy quieren decirnos que van a salvar el planeta. Es decir, es absolutamente, eh, creo, desde nuestra perspectiva, inaceptable, obviamente, eh, tener la posibilidad de pensar que eh, quienes están financiando los proyectos de muerte son los mismos que van a financiar eh, las soluciones en este sentido. Y lo último es que esto tiene que ver también deuda, finanzas, clima y, 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 este, y, este, y este elemento con la, el orden, obviamente, el, el orden de la geopolítica. Dos ejemplos muy claros eh, que tienen que ver con, esa, con ese modelo de aseguranza de deuda. En países donde han habido golpes de Estado, Haití, por ejemplo, es un caso muy significativo. Haití con un golpe de Estado en el 2004, obviamente suscitado por Estados Unidos y toda la impunidad de la comunidad internacional, viene arrastrando un proceso de luchas y un proceso también de invisibilización de esos procesos y la presencia de industrias extractivas es absolutamente fuerte ahí. Pero hacia afuera se nos quiere decir de que es un tema de, de gobernanza, no es un tema de acumulación, es un tema de poder, es un tema de racismo estructurado. Honduras en el 2009 con un golpe de Estado asegura y perpetúa la mercantilización de la vida y a través del proceso de disputa por, esa, por, por la defensa y el derecho al territorio se persigue, se criminaliza, se secuestra justamente hace... Eh, Ocho meses han sido secuestrados cinco líderes de la organización fraternal negra hondureña que estaban eh, y que hacen parte de un colectivo que lucha justamente por el derecho de los pueblos al territorio. Entonces, eh, creo que estos elementos quizás eh, para nosotras eh, podemos analizarlos y pueden tener varias, digamos, connotaciones. Concluyo diciendo esto. Eh, la deuda obviamente tiene un profundo diga, elementos que se conectan con todas las esferas de la vida. Efectivamente, cada uno podrá entender o conectar a partir mucho de esas propias agendas locales. Pero el, 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 el elemento central es que el modelo al que nosotros nos enfrentamos está creado justamente para seguir perpetuando un esquema perverso y malvado. Seguir financiando y seguir perpetuando la posibilidad que nosotros como sur global sigamos sosteniendo ese sistema. En esa lógica es muy difícil pensar en, en la sostenibilidad, no creemos en la deuda no es sostenible como tal, porque estamos hablando de dos cosas, de vida y muerte. En, ese, en, esa, en esa perspectiva creo que también eh, es quienes están ahí, las personas, las mujeres, los territorios, el pueblo. Entonces es, la deuda tiene connotaciones y tiene un impacto concreto en la vida cotidiana. Entonces agradecer por la posibilidad y poder colocar también estos puntos. Gracias. Gracias, Marta. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we don't have much time, but I don't know if there's any other intervention. Uh, and I'm sorry, we just scheduled uh, one, one hour, uh, but the, definitely the uh, amount of people that uh, uh, um, registered and, and participated and, uh, and the number of questions maybe call for a, for a second round. But I don't know if uh, either of uh, the ones who, who put the questions in the, in the chat, uh, Isabel, John or Rob would like to uh, intervene. I'll... John, please. Yeah, thanks, Martha, for that great intervention. Um, I just wanted to ask, I guess, about um, the report includes this recommendation on uh, reforming the debt sustainability analysis at the World Bank and IMF. So um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about what you see as some of the next steps in that, um, that would be really great. Over. Thanks, John. Uh, the, and this and this is a work that uh, as year that we've been doing for for some time and and we actually want to invest some time this year as well to uh, go more in depth into that and it links with uh, what Marta was uh, was saying like for for some people there's not such thing as uh, debt that is sustainable because that keeps reproducing the the financial system but I think we could uh, at least uh, have the conversation. Uh, on how uh, first climate vulnerabilities 
make that even more unsustainable and, and how this interact with the uh, IMF uh, debt sustainability analysis, the, the IMF and World Bank debt sustainability analysis. Someone, I think it was Rob also said, well, if, if you include climate risks into debt sustainability analysis, also, also into uh, credit rating agencies uh, um, risk analysis, uh, maybe debt will be borrowing will be more expensive because uh, it it makes uh, lending to those countries more risky. Uh, but maybe that also takes us to a point where uh, the actual way of financing infrastructure and financing uh, climate mitigation and financing energy transition projects uh, shouldn't be accessing to to the markets and paying um, interest rates that are uh, fixed by those climate vulnerabilities uh, for instance but uh, from our side we should be able to say uh, how if uh, climate investments are not being met if uh, policies on gender equality on guarantee and human rights are not being put in place because of uh, repaying of paying uh, debt service, then these debts are not sustainable. Uh, so how can we introduce human rights, gender equality, and also climate vulnerabilities in an idea of uh, debt sustainability? Uh, that opens a whole discussion that the Marta introduced of whether any debt <laughs> might be sustainable at all, but I think it's worth having the discussion. Uh, and it's also worth having the discussion in terms of uh, analyzing how these debt payments and, 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 and the debt levels are actually impacting in the country's uh, ability to tackle uh, the climate challenges, but also uh, human rights and, and, and SDGs in general and, and gender justice in, in particular. Uh, as I said, this is uh, this is an issue, an ongoing work, uh, also at Eurodat. Uh, so you will be probably uh, you will probably receive uh, messages from us uh, to to discuss this this further in the different areas on on climate, but also on on gender justice, for instance. I'm, I'm going to leave it at there because we got to the uh, end of the time we had uh, scheduled. Uh, th uh, this presentation is going to be uh, available on, 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 on YouTube, I think. Uh, we will share the presentation with you. We will share the different reports that we mentioned with you as, as background, not only the one uh, produced by Eurodat. Uh, I have to acknowledge that the, the report is more a compilation of others, other people's work uh, than uh, original research, but we thought it was good to have this uh, general uh, overview. We can send a, a follow-up uh, email to everyone who registered, and uh, there are uh, spaces both in the climate finance and in the debt community that we can discuss these uh, strategies uh, forward. If anyone is interested, uh, please contact us and we will include them in, in either meetings. And, uh, and I just, my, my last words are gonna be for the interpreters. So thank you very much, uh, Laia and David for the interpretation and for making it possible to have people from different language backgrounds uh, in the event. Uh, we will for sure keep working on these interlinkages of debt uh, and climate and uh, hope to count on, on you for that. Thanks everyone.